Welcome to the Airflow Podcast. I'm your host, Ricky Thomas, and this is the place where kingdom heirs go to be informed and inspired. So sit back, relax, and flow with me. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Airflow Podcast. I am your host, Ricky Thomas, and I'm excited to be back on again with you all um, this day and, and and really excited about the topic that I'm going to bring forth today um, because we're going to really focus on, you know, money um, and not I'm not talking about the love of money. I'm talking about management of money. I'm talking about investing money. And that's really where I want to hone in. Um, on today is really to to talk about investing, and you know I've I've done other episodes of investing, you know obviously focused just on stock um, and just really talking about how people love money and how the love of money is is you know the issue is an issue, but you know money is something that is necessary uh, for us to be able to take dominion over the things that we're called to as kingdom heirs, and so. We're going to flow on money today. We're going to talk about some things that I think a lot of people have read a lot or read a lot of information or they've they've been told or been to classes or just different things. And they have they've come up with different ideas around money. And I think it can be very difficult to navigate through different techniques of, of how to build wealth. Building wealth is really not difficult. Um, And I say that as I still sit here in pursuit of building my wealth, but it's really simplistic in in the process. Uh, The challenge is, you know, we get and I say we because it's me as well. We get into our emotions. uh, We get comfortable in the place that we are financially to some degree, or we trust in a system that is meant to keep us really focused and and locked into, uh, I don't want to say slave, but almost being a slave to that system where you work, you get paid a check and it's dependable money. As long as I'm working for this company, this company is going to pay me a, a fraction of its wealth in a salary and in turn, I take that salary and I base the living for myself and my family um, on that salary. And so you are sort of I, I hate to say, you know, pigeonholed, but you are sort of put into this into a box in terms of what you can uh, make. And again, it's all in perspective. It's all in perspective, you know, based off of who you are, because you know, as I mentioned on this on this podcast before, you see teachers who understand how to live with their salaries, which they're very underpaid, and they're able to take that money, live, you know, live their lives under their means and make big investments and be able to retire from a teacher from a teacher's salary, retire young and sit on, you know, some millions of dollars or retire and be business owners or retire and have all this passive income where they're not working for somebody, they're working for themselves. So understanding that it's not about how much money you have in the bank. It's not about how much money your salary is. It's really a a change in mindset. So I want to go through kind of a few ways to Grow money. I want to talk about some investment strategies. And and I really just want to I want to just kind of peak your content, your mind and and get into your mind a little bit. And hopefully with this start to chip away at some of the uh, misconceptions that some of us have been told over the years about money. You know, we've always been told, put your money in the bank and let it sit there. Don't touch it. And, you know, that is again not necessarily true. It's it's okay if you're just want if you just want to see your money in this in a place 
and be able to go and touch it and it's there, but it's not growing for you. You know, a standard bank account is going to be less than a percent, of, you know, in terms of interest gained over years, over a year. So you're not gaining any money off of that. Um, and I know people start looking at, well, if I invest, put my money in the stocks and I put them in this and put them in that, there's always a risk. There's a risk to a lot of things we do. There's a risk to getting up in the morning, getting in the car and driving on the road. There is a, a risk um, of going swimming. There's a risk of, of, you know, pretty much anything we do. There's always some level of risk. Uh, the question is, are you making smart choices? Are you making, are you taking calculated risk? Are you doing your research or are you going off of emotions? Um, and so I, I wanted to talk about a few ways. And, and the, the first piece of the first part of, of the episode, I want to talk about um, some ways of growing money. And it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily in a specific order. I think they're all important. And, and, and the order really comes to, or come is going to come from really where you are at that point in time, because some of these things you may already have in place and it might just be adding bits and pieces to it. Um, you know, filling in the gaps here and there to get to that next place. So, uh, first thing I want to talk about, and you hear this a lot again, you know, for anybody who listens to any kind of financial people, uh, they talk about emergency funds, you know, so setting up an emergency fund is, is going to be important to growing your money. And, and some people will say, well, why would I want to set up an emergency fund? You do have to think about having some level of savings. You can call it an emergency savings account. You can call it a rainy day fund. You can call it whatever it is. Um, I think at one point, you know, there was there was some experts that say you should save, you know, have at least six months of your salary saved. So, you know, take whatever your yearly, uh, whatever your yearly salary is divided by 12 and then that'll be kind of your monthly and then multiply that by six you know you can do that math or you can just say take half of what you make a year put it away um and, and put it away and then half of what you make i always say go with the gross not the net um go with the before tax amount so if you make you know seventy thousand dollars a year thirty five thousand dollars should be what you put up you know, we'll talk about taxes and all that stuff at another time. But that's kind of the mindset that, um, you know, you, you've got to first start taking. So when you talk about an emergency savings account or a rainy day fund or whatever it is, it's basically just taking money and, and putting it away for unexpected, um, unexpected uh, financial obligations that come up. And it can be anything. It can be you know, God forbid, unplanned medical procedures, you know, something happens to your car. Um, there's a trip that you have to take, you know, to visit a family member before some reason. Um, you know, the, these are these are things to stop you from building a debt, because if you have these to pull from, let, let's say, you know, there was a time I remember my wife and I in our previous house the compressor in our HVAC unit went out and, you know, it was, it was a situation where and I can't remember, I, I want to say, and, and she'll probably know the exact figure, but I want to say it wound up being about $2,500, maybe close to $3,000 to replace this. Now at the time it was freezing cold outside. I mean, it was in single digits, young family with kids, um, you know, and, and, and we didn't have any heat. So you can imagine that is an emergency, right? And of course, we had to call somebody out there and they charged us, you know, for an emergency run to come out there and do it. It wasn't under warranty, all that other good stuff. At that point, I knew I had to get it fixed. So what did I do? I had to put it on a credit card. Now, that created a debt. But with this, if I had an emergency fund set up, even if I did put it on a credit card, I can go right back and pay it off. And at the time, I believe we did have money saved up, even though we hated to touch our money because we were still operating under this different mindset of, you know, we want to see so much money sitting in our accounts. Um, and so 
that money and, and, and God had blessed us to be able to put money aside. We didn't call it emergency, but just to have a surplus so that when things came up, we can go pay for it. So we've been delivered a little bit from that. Um, but I just think about that, you know, that twenty five hundred dollars or three thousand dollars or whatever that amount was. You know, when we first got married, that would have crushed us in a lot of ways. It wasn't necessarily easy to swallow um, when we paid it then, but I was thankful that we had money to pay it off. We had money to to pay for that thing. And of course, it was like, oh, we got to hurry up and get that money back in. And so that's where I get into more of the spiritual side of it, because God, if he's blessing us with with money and blessing us with surplus to be able to continue to uh, build and grow our, our wealth and continue to give a seed to sow and we continue to prove that we are sowers and we continue to sow seed he's going to continue to replenish us so that's when you start looking at the spiritual part of you know where money is it's in it's an exchange and so we were able to do what we had to do and bless god we got it fixed and it was good but that's what having that emergency fund will do um you know i've read where it says basically you know really when you have an emergency fund set up It's one of the best ways to maximize or one of the best ways to maximize the saving potential of of an account like that. If you have an emergency fund, you have a lump sum of money. People talk about putting it in interest bearing accounts, Um, you know, high yield savings account or something like that. Uh, But it, it makes it a liquid investment. So your money isn't going into some type of long term account where you get penalties if you try to draw from it. You'll be able to withdraw cash when you need it, but it's gaining interest. Now, of course, you have to have certain amounts to start those accounts. But again, it's a thought process. It's understanding how I could use my money and and gain interest in that money to grow. And it's almost like passively doing it. You just have to make the initial investment to put it in there, make the decision to put it in there. And, you know, it's a win win because you're saving and you're growing it. So it's important to think about that, you know, have something to fall back on. You know, again, I know people say, well, it's not faith if you do that. It's not about faith at that point. It's about being a good steward of your resources, understanding that you have to got you. You've asked God for surplus. That's what that surplus is for. Um, The next thing that I want to um, bring forth is. Really, and it's probably one of the most important ones out of everything. They're all important, but establish financial goals. It is it's going to be basically um, difficult to fulfill your dreams if you don't even know what you want. Is there, you know, and, and it's hard. Some people just say, oh, I want a million dollars. Well, a million dollars now isn't the same as a million dollars was 10, 20 years ago. Inflation and all the other good stuff is 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 running rampant. I mean, and if you don't have a thousand dollars, a million dollars is a lot, you know, a million dollars is a lot to me. But again, you got to put it in perspective. But having a goal, having an understanding of what is financial freedom to you, having a target and a target doesn't have to be a static target. It can be dynamic. It can move. And and, and again, I'm going to weave in, you know, something from a spiritual standpoint, you know, you have certain targets set. And, then, and and I know this in my life and with with my wife and I and our family, you know, we set certain targets, certain goals and we do our due diligence. We're obedient. We, we hear from God. We pray about it. We reach those goals and then we think, you know, we made it. But then the target moves and God is like, no, we got to move to the next thing. And you're like, man, it's good. And, and it could be from material things. You see people, they get they they. They've been wanting this car and they do all this stuff and the car manifest. It's like you get the car and it's like, okay, it's cool. After a while, it's like, man, this ain't it. You know, there's another car like more expensive, you know, this, that or the other. But now the bar has been raised. Um, But when you start looking at goals and I don't want to get too far off topic, but when you look at goals, you have to have goals and understanding that, you know, again, to get to a place of growing your money You've got to have targets. So, you know, and understand it's difficult to achieve your financial goals 
if you don't have something to work towards. You got to have something to work towards. You can't just have this general statement of I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. You know, billionaire flow. And people hear billionaire flow, even though they don't understand the air part. And it's a play on words. But, you know, we're supposed to be millionaires, billionaires, trillionaires. We're supposed to be that. But you can't just throw out a blanket number. I can't just say I want to be a millionaire and, and not really have an understanding of what that means. Is that a million dollars liquid? Is that, you know, a million dollars in my bank account? What does that mean? And, and if, if your goal is to grow your money, which it should, then it helps to know really why you want to grow it. What is your purpose with that money? Are you going to be, you know, the old DuckTales cartoons, uh, Scrooge McDuck? He always had the, he had the big money vault and he would jump in and swim in the money, he had all the coins and cash and stuff in there. And he his whole thing was, I just want to be able to see my money and count it. He'll swim through it and count it. He knew every where every dime was. You know, is that what you want? You know, but what are your goals? You know, what do you want to work towards? Do you want to set aside money to buy a house? Do you want to start a business, have money to travel, education? You know, if you want to put your kids through private school or uh, pay for tutors or you know homeschool them and have the resources to pay for you know a private tutor or teacher to come in do you you know or college retirement you know these are all goals and, and a lot of them are common goals common things that people talk about or want but a lot of people don't take the time to really sit down and lay them out and so when I mentioned you know I, I, I've been working and studying been li- and got licensed in financial services, you know, looking at, you know, planning for college, retirement, uh, life insurance, uh, just different things like that. And it's amazing that there are so many services that have been out there for years. A lot of people just don't take advantage of it. Um, and I'm going to talk about that, you know, elsewhere because I don't want to mix too much stuff. But just understanding, you know, what are your goals? What, what is your what is your what is your financial outlook look like to you? What are you going to do with this money? And then once you pinpoint really what you want, what you want your money for, then you have a better mindset and to be able to take it and put tools in place to help it grow. So we're going to move to the next one. And this one, I think if I had to order any of these tools that they'll show you how to help your money grow or show you how to grow your money, uh, this one is really important. And I think this will be the number one thing. Change your mindset. That is simple but profound. Money is is wealth is a mindset. Growing your money is a mindset. Being broke is a mindset. And unfortunately, a lot of us have a broke mindset. Some of us don't know it. Some of us have had this mindset for for years. It's been ingrained in us. We learned it from our family members. Uh, Our parents, we grew up in an environment where that is a lot of times, but it is a mindset. Money is is what you what you think about money sometimes can be toxic. You can have a healthy relationship with money that but there is a relationship. There is a mindset. There is a a kind of centralistic thought process that all of us have from experience, whether it was direct or indirect. So when you think about, you know, mindset, you know, if once you kind of understand what your goals are, then you've got to really level up your mindset, because if you're not where you're supposed to be or not where you desire to be, you've got to figure out, okay, what do I think about money? What do I truly know? First, what do I know about money? But then what do I think about money? So determine what's blocking you from fulfilling your money goals. What is it out that's out there? What is it in your life that is stopping you? For some people, it's a fear. You know, it's a fear of just the thought process of it. it's the fear of potentially losing money. And fear is really understandable because it's going to be something new. And a lot of times change can bring upon, you know, some levels of fear. And, and, and a lot of people are like that with just personal finance in general. But here's the thing you got to understand. One of the best ways to combat fears through education. You've got to educate yourself. I would have never started investing in the stock market if I didn't get education. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't make mistakes. That doesn't mean I won't get things wrong. But I educated myself enough to know 
when I made a mistake, when I did something wrong, and then learning from that mistake and growing from it. But I got the education first. I talked to people. I found resources out there. I sought them out. I invested my money into those resources. So that way I knew I was at least coming in with a, 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 a level head. So not only did I invest my, my money, I invested my time, you know, because I had to learn how to do it. I had to take time to learn how to do it, which platforms to trade on, what stocks to look at, how to get into a stock, understand the difference between an investor and a trader. That's huge. But education was huge. Education was a big part of what we did. So, you know, really, once you've educated yourself on, you know, the thing that you fear when it comes to money, you still got to launch. You, you, you've got to launch that that process. You've got to kind of get away from, OK, I understand now why I'm why I'm afraid. But now I now that I, I've identified that and I've kind of gotten over the the fear initially. I got to figure out, OK, now I got to get started. Well, what do I do? What's the first step? And then once you get through that, you'll start to see that, you know, the, the financial topics that are out there, they're really not that scary. They're not difficult. It's just we've been told certain things. I'm going to go back to stock. I was told and, and I learned and through time it was just like, oh, man, stock is a, the stock market is a, is, it's a it's a rat race. It's crazy. It's it's a hoax. It's a scam. People just taking your money. You can't make real money in there. That's not for average people to do. And I think a lot of those things were perpetuated by people trying to keep the average person out of the market because they know it is a great tool to leverage to gain wealth if done right. And I'll talk about that a little bit later because, you know, for those that watch this and I may I may save some of that for um, when I have Joel Harrison back on. But my God, I mean, if you watch the news and watch the stock market. You'll start to see that things go hand in hand, but you've got to read between the lines. You've got to you got to open up your eyes and see how the market is playing out. But if you have fear, you won't do the research and you won't be open up to the open. Your eyes won't be open to really, truly see what's going on, because a lot of what's happening. People are able to gain money when the market goes down. They make money when it goes up and and, and all through that time. You've got people who are investing and trading. You know, they're doing long term investing when people are scared, like, oh, I'm selling everything. OK, that's fine. And people are making money off of that. But while you're selling and they're pumping that fear, they're buying, they're building, because guess what's going to happen? That market is going to turn around. And what are they doing? They're buying things on sale. That's the, but but if you're if you're feeding into the fear of it all and not seeing the growth potential, you'll miss it. It's cyclical. The market will drop. It will pull back 25 percent, sometimes more. Certain individual stocks may pull back 50 percent in a year and they come back strong and they go to new all time highs. But if you're not educated and you're living off of fear, well, you're going to play where they want you to play. So it's a mindset thing. It, it is a huge mindset thing. It's a shift that you have to do. And another shift is, you know, that's, you know, another mindset shift that you may have to make is. You know, expecting growth to happen overnight. And I'm just going to be honest. It is not going to happen overnight. Now, I am a, a big faith person. I believe if God, if it's God's time and he wants you to do it and he and it's the predestined pre, preordained time and it's going to happen. And, you know, so be it. Are there people who have who have gained, you know, amassed a huge amount of wealth in, in a short time or overnight? Yes, there's a ton of get rich quick stories that are out there. But guys, that's, it's it's unlikely that it's going to happen everywhere around. So are you going to focus on the the extraordinary, the abnormal, the the exception? Or are you going to go with the normal process? Because either way, it's going to be on God's divine time. But if you're showing that you're smart, you're able to do it, you're going to you're going to regain and reclaim time through the process. But it's using principles. It's using using your 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 information that you're gaining, your intelligence that you have, not doing it out of emotion. So if you really expect to learn how to make your money grow fast, then, you know, you're really not looking for the right thing. It's not about growing it fast. 
most people who gained wealth, true wealth, it, it, it's come from patience. You can be rich. And I see it all the time. You can you can put yourself in a position to where you are very rich fast. You can dribble a basketball, play, you know, play some kind of sport. You can have a viral video. You can have so many followers and you can get so much money coming in that now you've got they call it new money. You're very rich. You you have a lot of money going, a lot of things going for you. You got fame. But then how many of those people sustain that? See, wealth is, uh, I can't even speak, wealth is sustainable. Wealth is something that endures. Being rich, it is a mindset because you can be rich and wealthy is a mindset as well. But again, to sustain those things over time, that's what wealthy people do. Because they can, if you have somebody who's wealthy and they lose their money, I guarantee you they'll they'll regain their wealth again. Former president of U.S. Donald Trump, he he's shown that several times and he's never really I don't think he's really truly been broke on paper maybe but he kind of always comes back why is it that people who understand principle understands the mindset of how to how to gain wealth even if they take a loss they come right back even stronger because they they've learned from their experiences and then they've seen from their experience that they're not afraid to continue to do it so again it, it, it is a mindset you've got to change your mind we've got to change our mind the next thing is, and this is tough for people, set and stick to a budget. That is important to learning how to grow your money. And again, it's not about how fast you want to grow it. I mean, there are some things you can do to accelerate it, but having a budget, set a budget, you know, knowing exactly how much money that you that you bring in, how much money you earn and then how much money you spend is very important. And the best way to do that is, is having and, and, and sticking to a budget. And some people, you know, again, they try budget. They tried it before. They, they, they didn't have much success. And really, people who lack success with budgeting, is they, they really like discipline in it because you've got to hold yourself accountable. You really do. You've got to hold yourself accountable. Or, you know, if you've got a spouse who is is more financially astute than you are, you know, you've got to be OK to submit to their knowledge and submit to them and when it comes to that part i've said it millions of times or i'm saying millions but many times on this on this podcast my wife my wife kk she she has been you know she is she's very good with finances and if it wasn't for her you know and the knowledge that she has and, and me being smart enough to say look i'm not dumb when it comes to finances back then you know i was just ignorant because i had some I had some examples that I had to overwork. I had to overcome some some things that I had learned, some things that that had built up in my life that I that I thought was that's how you're supposed to do things. Some bad habits. I had to break those, and I had to have somebody who can help me. and And she did, and, and I always tell her that it, it comes easy to her, and she felt like you know this is easy. You should understand. I'm like, some things ain't common for everybody, but she worked with me on this whole approach of budgeting. She would show me, Ricky, look, here's all the money we got coming in. But look at all this stuff we got going out. This is why you can't just go out and buy you gym shoes and think everything is good. You know, I, and I wasn't big about doing it, but, you know, every time it's like, oh, you know, I got paid. You know, we might have a few extra dollars in the account. I'm going to go buy this thing right here. It may not even be for myself, but, you know, I'm going to buy it for her or buy it for one of the kids or do something. She's like, no, because we're supposed to have, you know, I like to carry over this much. And she's showing me the whole process. And I'm like, man, this sucks. And I'm saying that. But from her doing that, it's allowed us to be able to to amass more wealth and to be able to take that and use it for investing and spending in other things. I've watched how we've saved up for trips to be able to go travel debt free and not have to come back or put everything on credit cards and be paying off trips for years, you know, and because of this approach. So it, it, it is it is worth it to spend time with a budget because really it's, it's if you think about it, it's really giving you the opportunity to be in control of your money. And to do that, it really starts with understanding what you do with it. And I've done that exercise myself a few times. Um, you know, I've sat and there's there's free there's free charts out there, guys. There's free spreadsheets out there that you can go 
for family budgeting. It breaks down income coming in. It breaks out all your expenses from entertainment to educational to whatever it is. And you have to sit there and, and, and it's good to do because I had to sit there. I pulled up our account online. I'm going through our account and looking at the different expenditures that we have. That's that's reoccurring monthly. And you break it down. And it is it's a humbling experience. I would say that very humbling experience. But it's helped me to understand more about money and how if you if you use some discipline, it'll give you so much more flexibility to do more to build more and to grow it. And that's how we've gotten to the place that we are, that we've been, you know, through our discipline and through our giving. And we've seen, you know, just this exponential growth. So getting to the last couple of things, uh, last three things, I guess. Um, This one is, is key. And this is, again, something that helped us to get to the next place. Paying off your debt, 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 debt. Why? I don't know why we, we tend to, like to keep debt. I know people that say, you know what? I love new cars. I'm going to keep a car note. And and so if you budget and say, okay, I know I'm going to budget $600 a month for the rest of my life for a car. That's fine. Some people do that and and they're just realistic with it. I'm going to keep a car note. I don't plan on paying a car off. I'm going to use the car that I have as leverage to get another one. And to a degree, you know, you have financial experts argue don't do it. But if you've got that built into your budget, and you're having other you're coming up with other ways to offset that that money for the car note or other ways to offset or bring in more income to you know not where that doesn't even matter and that's fine you know that that is something that some people say it's a vice um but you know if that's something that you want to do that's fine but look at all the other debt that you may have because really with debt hanging over your head you know and and, and sometimes it can increase on a monthly basis it's really hard to think about how you can grow your money. How can you grow your money when you've got so much in the background that is holding you back? You got this this huge anchor on you. You're trying to you're trying to, you know, move forward and go to higher heights and you've got weights pulling you down. So the other piece of it is looking at let me come up with a plan to pay off your debt. And and it's, you know, again, there there are so many ways that you could eliminate debt. There's so many ways that you can leverage some of the assets that you have to eliminate debt, get out of high interest, um, high interest debt accounts that you may have, consolidate some things down to where you have lower interest rate to where you have lower interest rates to where your money is going more towards the principal, giving you the opportunity to pay things off faster. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we did and, you know, it. People, again, may not like his some of his his ways, but, you know, Dave Ramsey's whole principle on snowballing. We actually did that consistently, I would say. And my my wife, I have to correct me on my math. I want to say we did it for at least a good five years, maybe even more. But during that time, we paid off credit cards, medical bills, cars. um, You know, we we pretty much got rid of all of our debts. There's not a debt that we couldn't just pay off. And we started with the lowest. Again, the whole process of snowballing is you start with the lowest debt. Um, It could be the lowest thing that has, you know, that 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 has the lowest balance. So you tell you and I say lowest thing. So, you know, what what has the lowest balance? Pay that off. So that gives you another twenty five dollars a month. Add it. You take that twenty five dollars. You add it to the next one. You know, you should kind of rake them and say, okay, what what are my bills and, and kind of put them in order of balance. So I can pay this balance off first, you know, or look at which ones have the higher interest rates where, you know, if you pay those off, that actually helps you as well. So you you have to look at and and rank them. But once you get that order, you start with the lowest, you pay it and you just want the money that you, that you pay a month for the lowest one. Once that's paid off, you go to the next one. It's funny because we had, we had one, I think the balance was, it was less than $500. And we could have easily paid it off, but we were just so used to paying it in a monthly bill. And it's like, OK, when we started snowballing, it was like, ah, you know what? We paid it off. So now that freed up, I think it was 30 some dollars left, um, 30 some dollars a month or whatever. And we took that 30 something and put it on, put it on top of the payment we were doing for the next one. 
And I mean, we really start seeing it work. And I mean, it, it has, you know, the, these calculators, they, it's, again, it's spreadsheets. It's like an amortization calendar calculator. I mean, and, and it'll tell you like by this date, you know, if you make these payments, you will see yourself um, paying this off by this time. And they put in like little bonus payments in there. So like you get your tax refund. If you actually get money for taxes back, um, you know, you may make a lump sum payment of a thousand dollars once a year. Sometimes you might do something twice a year. You get taxes back. You may get a bonus from your job. You say, I'm going to take a fraction of that. And I'm going to put it back into the, the, the snowball. But it's a plan. You pay off your debt. That is the, that's one of the best plans. But understanding, you know, when you talk about paying off your debt, you know, you have the idea of loans and loans. Um, can be important financial tools that can help us accomplish a lot of things like, you know, getting our school paid for, getting a house. But the problem with a lot of loans that people get and you want to get to the point where you're not you're not the the person borrowing. You want to be the lender. But, you know, we've again making bad decisions, especially in our youth. We've we start getting into these high interest rate loans and it just leads to all sorts of unnecessary cost, And, you know, it becomes a big deal. So, you know, one of the stats that I saw out there is that, you know, the, it's estimated that the average American will spend over one hundred sixty thousand dollars in interest payments alone over the course of their lifetime. So you think about that for those that own homes that are, you know, paying mortgages, average mortgage, 30 years, you know, a big chunk of that. It is eats into that hundred sixty thousand or more. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at the amortization schedule of a house on thirty year loan. You pay quite a bit. Some cars you pay quite a bit. That's why you see a lot of uh, finance companies for auto loans. When you get a car, they're offering these, you know, these extended um, amount of months to pay off the car. You know, at first it was, you know, average is four year, three, four years. Then it was five years. Then it was six years. Then it was seven years. Then it's eight years. I think somebody said now you can do a 10 year finance, a 10 year finance for a car. And the interest rates are higher than what most of the time than what you pay for a house. And you're paying for 10 years. I mean, that could be a rental property. But it's it's a mind thing. But, you know, again, I don't want to go too far in it, but. You know, again, understand that paying off your debt will, you know, you'll reduce the amount of money you spend on interest payments. And then you'll have more money to use towards making your money grow. So you'll be able to invest in stocks or invest in yourself. So, again, come up with a plan to pay off your debt. I, again, will always go into the snowball process. Um, I think it, it, it works. So I'm going to I'm going to suggest that, you know, there may be other ways. And, you know, you may have other things that you've researched and found. But I know the snowball thing worked. The next one is it's one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, no duh, Captain Obvious. We know that. But if you want to learn and really look at how to grow your money, the other part is earn more. Sometimes it's changing a job, um, you know, or taking on another job. You know, I've, I've documented I've said it so many times on here. You know, I've, I've worked multiple jobs before to make more income. Um, I've left jobs to and gone to new jobs to for the pursuit of more income. Um, I've worked my way up through the companies that I'm at to pursue more responsibilities, which comes with more income. Now, that's what when I, when I said that, you know, changing your mind is important. Part of that is because when we were wife, when my wife and I were younger, a lot of times when we made more money, we got new jobs we always associated the new jobs with a new purchase. And and that was usually a car. Like, oh, we're making more money. We got, we got a few more hundred a month. I didn't think, you know, we, we, we didn't go out there and think like, oh, well, we need to take that extra few hundred dollars a month that we're going to get now for the new job and invest that. Oh, no, no. It was, well, now we can afford to get that car. And, you know, and again, I'm not I'm putting it on me because that was my mentality most of the time. You know, my wife said it all the time, like, why does it seem like every time one of us get a new job, we seem to want to get a new car or we get car fever. 
that that's always the thing you, you get that car fever like oh man you see i just want a car you know it's like oh, i'm gonna buy it it was always a car it never was a house i mean i think you know again we we we've, we've we don't jump up and buy houses that frequently in terms of the, the our actual our actual house that we live in um our first house we were in for uh, how long were we in that house we were in that house for about nine almost ten years you know the house that we just moved from we were in that house for 11 years you know so we, we don't just jump you know back and forth in the house or back you know to, into new houses but you know we we've gone through a car or two when we got a new job but you know, that's not the purpose of earning more. Again, if your mindset has changed, you earn more income so that you can invest more or you paid off debt, you earn more to pay off the debt you have, you've got debt. So then you would be able to start investing. But, you know, again, earning is, is one of the best approaches that you can take if you want to grow your money. And, um, you know, again, there's a lot of ways to do it. You know, you can ask for more money. Some of us, you know, they said closed mouths don't get fed. Some people don't even want to go ask for raises at work, even though they know they deserve it. But you ask. Sometimes it's just asking and putting it, putting it out there. And as, a you know, me being a manager, the kind of manager I am, if I know that the work that you're doing is quality and I know that, you know, you can probably make more going somewhere else and it's somebody I want to keep. You know, I'm going to advocate for you. And understanding that, you know, this again, it coincides with the fact that you've been working hard or you've been showing consistent effort. You've been doing what we needed you to do and going above and beyond. So is there a way to do it? I mean, I say play the game. If you want to make more money now, does it come with more responsibility? Yeah. But again, it's a means to an end. Because if your if your goal is not to work for somebody forever, if your goal is to increase your money that you can invest or get rid of your debt so that you can increase the money you invest. And so now you're getting to the place where, you know, you're you're seeing surplus of money. You can save, you can do trips, you can, you know, start to build these accounts up. You know, your process of, of, of doing that sometimes is just asking. And then when you do that, you know, with the raise, you have access, you have, you know, excess money that you can use to pay off debt, like I said, or invest or, you know, otherwise. Um, sometimes you grow up by changing your job or career. Again, that's another another way when you say earn more. Um, you can earn more by, you know, starting side hustles. And I say side hustles again, hustle in the, in the context of, you know, doing something legit, going out there, leveraging a talent or le leveraging, you know, a product. And I'm going to talk about that, you know, again, from a product standpoint, because, you know, th there's always these basic math or basic uh, things out there, pictures that, that I found where it tells you about if you invest this much, you know, for this long and do this and this and this, then you'll have this much money at the end. And it seems like, man, you know, that's really not that far away. But it's always like that. But then once you get into it, it's like, man, it seems like it's taking forever. It's like snowballing sometimes. You know, again, figuring out ways to earn more. Sometimes it's not going to happen just off a happenstance. You might just have to get out there and earn more money. So it is what it is. And of course, the 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 way that that I like to do, and I think everybody should, is invest, 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 invest. You have to take money. Put it into things that will grow and 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 take some calculated risk. I mean, that's that's the only way that that's a, it's it's the only it's one of the tried and true ways that wealth has been built in this country investing. And it can be in yourself through education so that you can build businesses and on your own. It can be investing in stock. It can be investing in real estate, whatever it is. But if you want your money to grow and, and I'm talking exponentially over time you've got to combine two things patience because you can't have you can't be a great investor and not have patience but you've got to have patience and then you have to be able to invest that if you want your money to grow over time and over time is the important part now that time could be you know 
Um, it can be leapfrogged in a lot of ways. It can, it can be it can grow to a to a huge degree from a or you can minimize the amount of time it takes to get from point A to point B on one of your your goals that we talked about before for finances. But you've got to have patience and you've got to invest. And, and sometimes it can be intimidating or scary. But investing doesn't have to be there. There are so many um, there are so many books out there. There's so much knowledge out there where people have taken, you know, five hundred thousand dollars and they started to invest it in, in different things. And over time, you know, they with the right investments and content, sometimes it's continual investments. You know, you may start off with. Five hundred dollars initially, and then you put in X amount every few weeks when you get paid. And you just keep doing that. And you tackle, you put in compounding it, interest, and now you've got something going. But the key factor in that is time. Everything is not going to be an overnight Dogecoin success for those who know about crypto, where Elon Musk tweets out something and Dogecoin goes up a couple of decimal points and then people who own three billion coins of something because it was like, you know, less than a penny when they first got it and just something pops up and now you've got all this money because again, it was a short time. Um, and, and, and again, that's a volatile market and, but that is something to invest. I invest in crypto. I invest in stock. I do that. Um, and getting ready to start investing in some other things, looking at annuities already doing that um looking at real estate obviously that's that's one of the oldest ways tried and true you know looking at retirement different retirement type accounts that you can invest in i mean there's so many things you know so you can grow your money with retirement investment accounts 401ks um i've learned some new stuff about 401ks with i'll say this if you're working for a company and, and the, the employer does a matching. Do the 401k up to the maximum that they will match it. Don't go above that. I'm not going to go into detail there. I'm just going to tell you. Get your free money from their matching. If they say, OK, we'll match up, we'll match, you know, you dollar for dollar up to three percent. Some places used to do six percent. And so if you contribute 3%, they'll contribute 3%. You contribute 6%, they'll contribute 6%. They're basically doubling your investment. And that's free money coming to you. So I always say, you know, take advantage of that. But you got 401ks, you got Roth IRA, our IRAs, traditional IRAs, um, you know, index funds, ETFs. And that's what a lot of these 401ks, they invest in a lot of those. They just mix them and put them in different one, different kinds of those funds. So you can do it yourself, too. Um, but, you know, again, there's all kind of investment vehicles. You can do stock yourself. Um, there's college uh, funds out there, the 529 plans. You've got, you know, health savings accounts for, you know, uh, tax way, tax kind of efficient ways to pay medical expenses. So it's all it's all kind of ways. Like I said, I like stock. I like um crypto i like that space but there are so many ways to invest out there so those are the 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 ones that i want to talk about today you know just of how to grow your money um and i want to leave you with a couple of just some nuggets on on growing money through you know building a product or investing it's just simple stuff when you think about it um because i saw this and i said you know this this is really this is really just interesting things that nuggets that I think that we need to put out there. So when you talk about, you know, there's rules of money, there's, you know, why the rich get richer. And it, it compares the middle class to the the somebody who has a rich mindset. So I'll kind of I'll start with, you know, why the rich get richer. And so in this illustration, um, they talk about the difference between middle class and a rich mindset. And, you know, some of this comes out of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you read that book, I suggest everybody reads that book. Um, great book. I think that is one of the when you talk to anybody who's in the finance world or want to talk about how people can get wealthy. And, and, you know, we talk about changing your mindset. That book is one of those things that you need to invest in in terms of changing your mindset about money. 
but they talk about the middle class and they talk about, um, you know, we talk about why the rich get richer. Well, the middle class, they have an illustration and it's a picture of a car and it says for that car, let's say you spent $60,000 to purchase that car. So you may not pay it all up front. Obviously, if you're paying, you know, if you're financing it, then that means you're paying for, you know, with interest and everything, you're going to pay more than that $60,000 sticker price. But let's just say for the purpose of the exercise, the total car amount would be 60000 You know, there's a 15% depreciation per year. So you think about that. So each year is going to depreciate. So after year one, it's going to be 51000 It'll go to 43 something. By the time you're done, the car value will be maybe worth 17,000, depending on the kind of car. So when you look at that, you know, you talk about, you know, money in that mind, a middle class mindset, money goes into liabilities that are nice at first, but they only decrease in value over time. So now the rich mindset is, you know, maybe you didn't you get a car where you buy cash. You don't have a car note. Something that's going to just get you from point A to B. Doesn't have to be a clunker, decent car, whatever. And you say, okay, I'm going to take 60000 I already have a car. I don't need a new car. It's paid off. So I don't have a need to go do that. Because, again, a lot of times, especially in our culture, uh, y'all know what I mean. You know, we want to be seen looking good. We want to be seen looking like we've got a bunch of money and we're rich when we really don't. And a lot of wealthy people... Again, I say wealthy, not rich, that new money, but a lot of wealthy people, half the time you don't even know that they're millionaires, billionaires walking amongst you because they're not about showing their wealth. They build it and they they can do things. They can walk around amongst different people and not have to worry about that kind of stuff. Uh, But when they look at the rich mindset, when you take that same sixty thousand dollars that the middle class might have invested in a car. $60,000 $60,000 invested, and I say invest when you purchase because that's the spend versus an investment. But when you invest $60,000, and let's say you get 10% um, over eight years that you get. So over an eight-year period, you're getting 10% per year back. So your return on your investment is 10%. So 60% investment and 60% invested over 10 years, I'm um, sorry, over eight years with a 10% uh, interest gain in it by the time you get to that eighth year you've doubled your money 60 percent turns into i'm sorry sixty thousand turns into one hundred twenty eight thousand dollars. because see when you have that rich that wealthy mindset money goes into assets that grow your money over time rental property stocks gold things like that it is all about the mindset and people will look at that and say wow that's crazy So over the same eight year period that you spent on that car with the 15 percent depreciation, that 60,000 went from value of 60,000 to a value of 17,000. Versus when you invested 60,000, it went from, you know, that $60,000 you initially put down or put into whatever kind of account that you were going to grow it in that getting that's getting you a 10 percent yield which, you know, most 401ks or, you know, a lot of um, most 401ks or, you know, when you start looking into annuities or not necessarily annuities, but when you start looking into um, index funds and things like that, they use the average about 10%. And when you're doing indexed, and this is something you got to learn, this is, this is something that, you know, I, I'm, this is where I'm going to business. When you start dealing with indexed, you don't when the market drops, you don't lose money. You only gain if it goes up. You don't lose when it goes down. But again, that's that I just dropped that little nugget. If you want some more information on that, holler at me. Um but you invested sixty thousand dollars. Eight years later that double. And some of us uh, there's people that I know that are sitting on, you know, money that they've built up over the years and they just put it in their in this savings account. Imagine if you can take that money, put it in an account, you can still have access to majority of it, but it's gaining those kind of that kind of gain. And you're not losing money. Eight years, eight years of doing nothing, doing nothing, but just investing and not even touching it. Because if it was sitting in your savings account, most people would be like, I'm not touching that anyway. Imagine that. But it's it, it's a mindset and it truly is a mindset. So 
I'm just going to share these uh, the difference between millionaires and and I know sometimes it's it, it seems harsh, but broke people broke is a mindset. You know, you can have a millionaire mindset, you can have a broke mindset. So here's some here's some bullet points about the tuning. I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up. But this illustration said that millionaires read daily. They set goals. They compliment. They embrace change. They forgive. They talk about ideas. They continuously learn and they take responsibility responsibility for their failure. So I'm going to say that again. Millionaires read daily. They set goals. They compliment. They embrace change. They forgive. They talk about ideas. They continuously learn and they take responsibility for their failures. On the flip side, broke people. They watch TV daily. They look at other people's lives and they look at these. They live in these fantasy worlds. They watch TV daily. They never set goals. They criticize instead of compliment. They fear change instead of embrace it. They hold grudges instead of forgiving. They talk about people instead of talking about ideas. They think they know it all versus continuously learn. And they blame others for their failures instead of taking responsibility for their failures. So. If if you got if got offended by what I just said, you've got to take some, you know, you got to step back and 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 you know do some self inventory of 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 you and and think through that. Why are you offended? Some of us probably could use could, could spend some time not watching TV and reading more. I know I do, I, and that's why I I purposely start to. You know, read books that, you know, our pastor, he Apostle Howard, he he's always got us reading different books because, you know, he's like millionaires read a book. You know, it's really a book a week, but, you know, a book a month. He challenges us to read, to grow ourselves spiritually, to grow ourselves, you know, financially, physically and every and every aspect. That's true prosperity. So if I'm just sitting here watching TV all day, how am I getting better now? Can you learn things? Yeah, you can be watching. I mean, if you're watching MSNBC, you know, or something that's helping you understand about, you know, the market. Okay. But watching reality shows ain't it. Now, it's entertaining, but that was something I saw. They talked about, you know, middle class look for entertainment. They pay to be entertained. You know, broke people pay to be entertained. Wealthy people, you know, they, they spend their money they, on investment. They spend their time. What kind of investment? Now, do they, do they get entertained? Yes, but they don't invest in their entertainment like that. Are you setting goals? Do you compliment people or do you just criticize? Why do they spend their money on this? This makes no sense. Are you, you know, looking at change and say, you know what? This change is going to be good. It's probably what I need to get me out of my comfort zone. Or are you just like, I hate change. I don't want to change. And you go kicking and screaming. You know, the old saying, that's the old saying goes, change is inevitable. So either you're going to accept it, embrace it, or you're going to fight it. But either way, it's going to happen. And you're going to be left behind if you don't get to the point. And when I'm talking about change, we're changing where you change your mindset to understand about how money works and how it can work for you. Holding grudges. That's one of the worst things you can do because you spend time thinking about people and giving them, as people say, real estate in your mind or in your head that they don't even need to occupy. You're so focused about them, you know, holding grudges, talking about people, spend more time talking about the next person versus focusing on all those uh, focusing on all those ideas that you've had talking about them, verbalizing them, getting them out there. Are you constantly looking to learn or are you just thinking, hey, I read this on YouTube. I mean, I, I watched this on YouTube. I read it on Google. So I know it. I think I know everything. I'm, I'm a jack of all trades. Or do you really know something about it? Are you really learning? See, I always read stuff. I always like to, if there's something I don't understand, I like to dig into it more. I'm not an expert at everything, but I know, I know a little bit, but I know I don't know it all. And see, I'm humble enough to go and ask somebody. When I went to to Joe and I, I keep mentioning him because, again, I could have easily, you know, got online and read things about how to invest stock and this, that and other. But I was referred to Joe Rodney Harrison. Another shameless plug, Joe. Um, I was referred to him by somebody that I saw doing investments and seemed like he knew what he was talking about. And he could have easily said, yeah, I'll show you, blah, blah, blah. He was like, no. I got somebody that I think you I think you'll be good to come into this group. He invited me into this Facebook group, you know, in, in the inside of trade, the inside of trading. And, you know, from there, I started to build 
knowledge from not just the leaders of the group, which is Joel and, and, and Noble. But through time, you know, I started paying for classes, investing my own money into my own education. That was continuously learning. And then, of course, when I made mistakes, I made some bad investment mistakes. I took responsibility for them, and now I'm correcting those. I didn't blame everybody else. Oh, he didn't tell me that, or oh, he he should have, you know, did this, or they could have. No, it's not them, them or they or he or him. No, no, it's me. Take responsibility for it. So, again, I always, when I always talk through these, um, I always talk through these episodes. I'm talking to myself a lot of times. And I'm hoping that I'm I'm reaching some of you guys when we start talking about money. What is your mindset? What is your thought about money? And why do you think about money that way? If you think money is truly evil, why do you think that? What experiences have you lived in your life that caused you to think that? And I'm not saying you're right or wrong, but the question is, when you look at it, is it really truly the, the truth about the money or is it about more your experience and or your bad experiences that you've had or how you've been taught or misinformation or just ignorance? With me, it's a it's a mixture of all of it growing up. I had good examples. I had bad examples. I had the people I had family members that lived off credit cards and they spent all their money paying off these credit cards or moving one credit card debt to another credit card debt, having credit cards for every single store that was out there. Because if they did it, they would get certain perks, certain discounts, and they would go run up a bunch of money and then spend so much time paying it off. See, I didn't learn about investing. Not not from not in that way. Now, getting 401ks and stuff like that. Yeah, my, my parents did that but when it comes to buying stocks and and, you know, buying real estate. And, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of those um examples around I had some but you know not a lot to where it was just constantly in my in my view it was more of hey go to school get your high school diploma go to college you know get a degree go out there work a career retire at the age of 50 whatever 59 and a half whatever it is you know and live off your 401k and social security and all that other good stuff that's the good life that's the American dream that that dream has changed. So again, as I always close out as kingdom heirs, it's our responsibility to be a fiduciary of the blessing, the monetary blessings, the seed that God continues to give us. We have to be very astute financially. We cannot claim dominance over everything that God has meant for us. And we're ignorant to how to get it and how to leverage the 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 seed, the money that he's providing for us. There's so much knowledge out there and we have to take dominion. And and to do that, we have to learn. We have to break the cycle. We have to break the 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 old traditions that tell us that money is evil. The love of money is. But money is not evil. Money is a tool. Money gives you option. Money opens the door for us. It doesn't come before God. It doesn't come before your spouse or your kids. But it is a tool that will allow you to have. To be able to exchange certain things, to be able to move and live and, and, and do things that can create a generational. A generational wealth surplus for your family for the kingdom a a surplus of supply so that's why it's important to tap in and flow with me on this let's flow together we are billionaires we are heirs of the kingdom and we are meant to flow in that i love y'all god bless you talk to you next time